Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and yes, this is the real me, but only for the introduction. In this video, I want to introduce you to Swift subscripts. I'll step you through the basics as they apply to arrays and dictionaries so that you get a general understanding of what subscripts are and how they're used with Swift collections. I'll then show you how you can create your own custom subscript and in the process, share how you can use subscripts to make your code safer and more generic. We'll finish this by creating two rather useful extensions, one for a string and one for arrays, and both are extensions using subscripts. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. I've created a sample playground for this video and I recommend that you download it from the link in the description. There are different pages covering each of the different topics that I referred to in the introduction. Make sure you set the pages to view rendered markup so that you will be able to easily move between different pages using the navigation links. Once completed, you'll have a reference to go back to in the future. In Swift, a subscript is a shortcut to accessing elements of a collection, list, or sequence types such as arrays, dictionaries, and strings using square bracket notation. A subscript enables you to access a value of a collection or sequence type by supplying an index or key in brackets, like an array or a dictionary. And in Swift, you can define custom subscripts for your own types, allowing you to provide a more convenient and intuitive way to access elements in your custom data structures. Subscripts can also be defined with one or more parameters, such as an index or key, and can return a value or a reference to a value. It can also be used with both read and write access, allowing you to modify the values in a collection or a sequence type directly through the subscript. Overall, subscripts provide a powerful way to access and modify elements of your data structures in a more intuitive and efficient way and are a fundamental part of Swift programming. So let's get started. For completeness, bear with me if you already know this stuff. I promise we'll get into more sophisticated examples and you can use the chapter links in the description to jump to those sections if you like. But first, let's just confirm what we know about subscripts. Consider this array here of five integers. Arrays and other collections are zero based. So if I want to access the third element of this array, a three, I need to supply the index of two. When I print this out, I see that it's correct. You can use the subscript index to change values as well. So to change the fifth element, the integer 5, to a 6, we access the subscript at index 4 and assign a new value. If I print the entire array, I see that the fifth element has been updated. If I try and access and print out an element that is at an invalid subscript, like 6, we get a fatal error and your app will crash. This error is the index out of range. In a later example, I'll show you how you might protect yourself from this. So an array can be an array of user-defined objects, like this person struct, and I have a variable called people that is an array of these three objects. If I want to print the name of the second person in the array, Sam, I first need to access the object by its index, which is 1, and then I can specify the property, which is name, and I can print this out at the same time. Similarly, if I want to change the name of the first person from Jenny to Jennifer, I can access that object, which is at index 0, and specify the name property and update it. I can use the index of the subscript to loop through an entire array by specifying the range from 0 up to, but not including the count. And then I can use that iterated index to print out the specified property at that index. Dictionaries are another type of collection that use a key for the subscript instead of an index. Consider this dictionary of ages, which is a dictionary of key-value pairs, 
for the key is a string representing the name and value is an int representing the age. To access the age or value of the key Alice, we access the dictionary's value for that key using the key as the subscript. If we make a typo or try to access a key that doesn't exist, our app wouldn't crash like it does with an array. Instead, it returns nil. This is why we're seeing that our age of Alice is optional. We could use nil coalescing here to provide a default value if that one didn't exist. For example, if I want to determine the age of Stuart, which is not a key in the dictionary, we can do this here. And when we print out the code block, we see Alice's age is no longer an optional 25, but Stuart's age is unknown. Updating values in a dictionary is done the same way. We specify the key and provide a new value of the expected type. To loop through a dictionary, we can specify both the key and the value in our for in loop so that we now have access to both. If we want to print out only ages, which are the values, we can print them out like this by using the iterator's key value as our subscript. Now, since we're not using the value in our code block in this loop, we can replace value here with an underscore. And this will be optional, so we could use a nil coalescer here. Now, when you think about this nil coalescing, however, how could this ever fail as we are looping through a dictionary and picking out its keys? So in this case, we can break the cardinal rule of never force unwrapping, because I think it's pretty safe so we can force unwrap. Moving on now to more interesting things about subscripts. I'm going to start with a typical example that will demonstrate how you can use both custom subscripts and generics to improve your code. Take a look at this matrix example. I have three arrays of four integers, all are zeros, inside another array. If I option click on the constant's name, I see that it's defined like this. It might be easier to visualize if I remove the line breaks. Now, I want to create a struct that I can use to create a matrix instance like this, but allowing for any number of rows or columns. So my struct will call matrix and it will have one mutable property that I'll call grid, that is that array of array of int. Now the only time I want to currently use the number of rows and columns is when I initialize this struct. So I don't need to specify them as properties, I can just add them as parameters of an initializer. Within the body of the initializer, I can create a row by using an array constructor that allows me to specify what I want to repeat, which is the initial value, and in my case that's a zero, and then indicate how many, which is the number of columns, so that will be calls. The grid then will be another array, repeating this time though the row as our initial value, a row number of times. So to create an instance of a matrix with five rows and two columns, it's easy. And then I can print out the grid property of that matrix to see it in the console. Now if I want to change the value of the element that's the fourth row, second column, I'll need to provide both subscripts like this of the grid property. So that will make it at index three for the row and index one for the column. Printing out the matrix again shows that this is updated. So let's create a custom subscript to make access and changing of elements a little easier. So I'm gonna copy the code from the previous example and let's build on it. 
we define subscripts the same way that we define functions, except we don't use the func keyword, we use subscript. And in our case, we'll need two parameters, a row, which is an int, and a column that's an int. And when we're accessing that value, it's going to return another int. Now, if we just want to retrieve the value, that's a getter. And all we need to do then is to return the grids property at those two indices like we did in our first example. If we want to change the value of a particular location, that's a setter. And for this, we'll need to know what that new value is. Then we update the value for the grid at those two specified indices with the new value. So for example, let me create a four by eight matrix. That's easy to do. Now, if I want to set the value of the fourth row, which is index three and sixth column, which is index five to a five, I can do this now by accessing the matrix's subscripts, not using the grid property at all. You'll notice if you're following along with this sample project that some of my comments prompting you for what to do with each example are different from what you see in the video. I'm pointing them out as I go through here, but I've updated the starter and completed projects with the correct prompts. Well, subscripts parameters can also be name parameters. So if we go back to our subscript definition and add labels for row and column, and I'll just use the same string, row and column. Now, when I access the subscript, it's a bit more clear. If, however, I try to print one of the values for some subscripts that are out of range, I still get a fatal error. So maybe we can fix that. So let's copy that last struct and move on to the next code block. In our getter, we want to restrict only rows and columns that are within the possible range of choices. The problem right now, though, is that our row and column properties are only in the initializer and not accessible to the subscript function. I can fix that by adding two more properties to our matrix struct. One for rows, that'll be an int, and another one for calls, which is another int. And then within the initializer, I can assign the values passed in to them within the body. Now, both of these properties are available for us to use in our subscript function. Instead of returning an int now, though, I want to do like what dictionaries do. If I try to access a value for a key that doesn't exist, it returns nil. It's an optional value. So I'm going to change this now to be an optional int that it's going to return. Now then, I can use a guard check to ensure that our specified row is greater than or equal to zero. And at the same time, it's less than or equal to the actual number of rows minus one. And I'll do the same for our column. So if this guard fails, we return nil. The new value that we assign now will have to be unwrapped. And this is another case where force unwrapping is just fine. Now we can create a matrix with four rows and five columns. If we want to access the value at row three, column four, and print it out, we now see we get an optional value. If we try to access one that is out of range, like at row four, column one, this would be index five for the row, which only goes up to four, we no longer crash, we get nil. We can, however, always add nil coalescing like a default of minus one if the result is nil. Now when we print, we're no longer optional. 
Let's improve our example by converting the matrix to be more accommodating so that we can use any type of object for our element and define any default value so long as it's that specified type. So let's copy the last example and add in the generic placeholder of T when we design our struct. We'll also need to specify a default value, which is the same type as our initializer. Now our array will be repeating that default value. We'll return the optional type now instead of an int. So let's create a three by three matrix where our default value is going to be a string such as a dash. I can print this out. This might be a representation of a tic-tac-toe grid. If I want to change the center one, which is at row one, column one, to an X, it's easy to do. Well, you're not limited to a single subscript. You can have many. So let's copy that matrix and examples from the last example, and I'll show you what I mean. I want to create a subscript that will return an entire row array of those types. This subscript then will only have a single parameter, which will be the row int, and it will return an array of those types. Since this will be used to get the values only instead of setting or updating, all I need is a getter. And if that is all you need, you don't need to specify the get keyword. We'll just return the grid at that row. When I print, I see we get that array. And finally here, if I want to generate an array of a particular column, I can specify the column only as the subscript and return another array of those types. Now we can determine that array by acting on the entire array of rows and using the map function to extract from each of those four internal arrays, the specified column item. Perfect. Now the more astute of you will realize that this is not exactly perfect because I'm not doing any guard checks to ensure that for my single subscript options, we are ensuring that our row or column is within a valid range. In the interest of time, because I have a couple more examples to do, I can leave that up to you. On this final playground page, I want to take you through how you can add subscripts to Swift types through extensions. First, let's take a look at a string that has a star in the middle. It's an emoji. If I had to access that star and print it out, you might think that since a string is just a collection of characters, I could access and print out that character, which is at index three. Instead, I get this error, however, because a subscript with an int is not available. We'll need to use a string.index instead. And without getting into too much detail, it's because a string can contain emojis like this that are actually made up of multiple characters. So what is a string.index? Well, we can specify an index by using the index method on a string where I can specify a start point, which in our case, we can use the strings static start index property, the beginning, and then specify what the offset will be. And that is what we think of as our index by visually inspecting our string, which in our case is gonna be the three. Now we can access the star using this index and our code no longer complains. Inspecting this though, I see that this star emoji is actually a character, it's not a string. So if I want to convert it to a string, I can do that. Printing this out now, I see this is exactly what I want. Now, if I want to update the character, I still have to do some more work. I need to determine its location, 
And I can do that by using a subrange of characters. So I'll start with the specified location, which we have at that index. And then I step up to the next index, which in our case will be 4. And then I can simply replace the string at that subrange with a new value, which is going to be a heart. Now, wouldn't it be nice then if we didn't have to go through that huge process? Well, we can simplify by creating an extension on string. So above this code block, I'm going to create that extension. And I'm going to create the subscript function. And for the parameter, we're going to specify the index as being the int that we want to use instead of that string.index. And then return a string instead of a character. Now it's going to require a getter and a setter where I provide a new value. So let me just copy the code from above and modify it to meet my extension's needs. So first the getter. That str represents the string itself. So I can replace it with self in all cases. And then the offset will be the index parameter. Let me just change this to char for character. And then I can simply just return the string representation of that character. Now for the setter. Again, I'm just going to copy from the previous example where I did all the work. And I'll replace the str with self because we're making this generic to apply to any string. And the offset is going to go from the start index right up to the index plus 1. And then we can replace the subrange with the new value. I can even make this one safe by doing a guard check to ensure that the index is positive or greater than 0, but still less than the count of characters. Otherwise, we'll just return. So in our example, then, we can access the string at index 3, and it's now valid. Similarly, if I want to update the fifth character, which is at index 4 with a heart, I can do that. Now, one last thing if you're still with me. Let's create a safe subscript for arrays so that our app won't crash if I'm trying to access an index that is out of range. Like this. So let's create an extension on array outside this code block so that it's accessible. For the subscript function, we'll provide an index, but instead of returning an element, we're going to return an optional element so that if it fails, it will return nil and not crash. Well, this allows us to use a guard check to ensure that the index is greater than or equal to zero and the index is less than the actual count of items in the array. Otherwise, we'll return nil. Then we can simply return the element at that index. If I test, however, I see that we still crash. And this is because in our case, unlike our string extension, our original subscript takes precedence as both have ints as parameters, unlike our string case where one was an int and the other one was a string.int, so it couldn't differentiate. So in order to differentiate here, we'll have to add a label for our safe case, like safe. So now, when we want to access the safe version, we can simply provide a label. Now, when we access an invalid index, we are provided nil. Accessing a valid index now, though, returns an optional. 
So you'll have to be aware of this and unwrap it in your code, but at least it's safe and your app won't crash. Well, that's the end of this video, and I hope you've learned something useful that you can use in your code, or at least have a better understanding of how subscripts function, and perhaps create your own custom subscripts or extensions. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. This will help drive more traffic to my channel. And subscribe to the channel and ring the bell to get notified of new videos as they are released. Thanks for watching.